Um, welcome. Uh, my name is Amanda Mahaffey. I am a deputy director at the Forest Stewards Guild. And today I'm very excited to um, facilitate this webinar today offered by Dr. Bill Keaton and Dr. John Gunn. Um, this is on the science of carbon forestry and they have plenty more to say about that. So I don't feel like I need to introduce the topic. Um, Dr. Keaton is a professor of forest ecology and forestry at the University of Vermont's Rubenstein School of Forest, uh, sorry, of Environment and Natural Resources. Dr. Keaton researches forest ecosystem sustainability through the lenses of forest carbon management, climate change mitigation, natural disturbance ecology and silviculture, and the structure and function of old growth and riparian forests. Dr. John Gunn is a research assistant professor of forest management at the University of New Hampshire and executive director of the nonprofit Spatial Informatics Group Natural Assets Laboratory. Dr. Gunn's research falls within the realm of understanding what ecological forestry tools we can use to reduce this divergence between managed and natural ecosystems. So Bill, if you're willing to share your screen, um, we're gonna get rolling. Um, the science of carbon forestry is a very important topic these days and we really appreciate you all zooming in. Um, if you have questions, please type them into the chat window and we'll do our best to address questions after the presentations conclude. Thank you. Okay, great. Well, thanks a lot, Amanda, for that introduction and for the invitation, of course. And thanks everyone for coming today. This topic of carbon forestry is vast, as I'm sure all of you know. We could easily spend probably the better part of a day talking about this. And we could probably have lots of different perspectives and ideas about any number of different topics. So I can't possibly claim to be able to give you the complete picture, but I'm going to try to give you at least my take of the, of the science and a little bit about how that's evolved in recent decades and maybe some of the basic concepts that, that folks need to sort of carry forward with this. And, and I think it's, um, it's a good time to have this, web, this webinar because you know, it's clearly a hot topic and there's a lot of debate right now around the, the various approaches that have been, a, been proposed for, for carbon forestry. And so I'd like to pull that apart a little bit and go through some of the countervailing proposals and ideas that are out there in circulation. Okay, so throughout the talk today, I'm gonna to try to make a pitch or an argument, which is that rather than one particular approach to carbon forestry, rather than a one size fits all kind of deal, we need a portfolio of carbon forestry options. And the good news is, We've had so much research on this topic in the last 20 or 30 years that we have a pretty good idea what those are. And everybody attending this webinar, everybody from New England can probably appreciate why a portfolio is important, why we need a diversity of approaches. Maybe something like what David Lindenmeyer and Jerry Franklin way back in 2003 called risk spreading in their book called Conserving Forest Biodiversity you know, when even then there was this awareness that in a, in a landscape as complex as ours, okay, yeah, they were talking about the Pacific Northwest, but it applies here too. A landscape as complex as ours that's so heterogeneous in terms of site quality and, and forest diversity and land use history and disturbance history and landowner objectives, there is simply not one approach only to carbon forestry that's going to work. We need a variety of things. And this is important as an insurance policy to spread the risk a little bit because we aren't certain how any one particular approach is going to play out over the next hundred years, particularly in the, con in the context of climate change and invasive species and potential loss of foundational species like hemlock and other things. And so we have to spread the risk a little bit and try different things. So a portfolio of carbon forestry options and risk spreading. Those are the two key concepts for my talk. Now this actually dovetails very nicely with the framework that the Nature Conservancy has, um, has been promoting in recent years, which they call climate, natural climate solutions or NCSs. And you know, in this approach, we might look at all of the different sectors that can contribute um, to climate mitigation through carbon sinks, so agriculture, wetlands, coastal resources, and of course the forest sector. But rather than again there being a single approach for each of these sectors, we might look at the whole tool bag out there, everything from reforestation to avoided forest conversion into other land uses, 
uh, fuels and fire uh, restoration in fire prone systems, urban forestry, and of course, improved forest management, a whole variety of different silvicultural approaches. And each of these will contribute in turn towards meeting our, our climate objectives. And, and in, in the case of this figure here, meeting the US's commitments to the Paris Climate Accords. Um, the key here, if you look at those bars that go to the right under each of these approaches, let's just use forests as an example, is that some of these will be easier than others. Each, each color is basically a dis different discount rate that was modeled in this framework as a way of portraying kind of the low hanging fruit and the high hanging fruit. You know, and the, the idea is that there are probably some, some emissions reductions or avoided emissions that we can achieve pretty easily right off the bat with certain things. And then other things that are gonna be harder over the long term. But at least with this kind of framework, the natural climate solutions approach, we have some idea what the maximal potential is in terms of the contribution that the forest sector can make to emissions reductions. Okay, but notice again that we're talking about a portfolio of, of options, not just one approach. Okay, so the key to understanding all of this, and we're gonna to go to just a really basic level now to make sure that everybody's on the same page when we talk about the carbon cycle. And I'm just gonna say that what I'm about to show right now is the source of a lot of confusion and disagreement out there in our field, in our community. And so it's good just to take this on right, right from, from the outset. Okay, so there, there are kind of two key parts to the carbon cycle in terms of forests that are critical for understanding the various different ways in which we might manage forests for, for carbon functions. So of course, there's sequestration or uptake of carbon dioxide through the process of photosynthesis, which then of course converts carbon di dioxide into biomass that is stored in vegetation above ground, live and dead, and of course also below ground in the soils and in various below ground organisms. Okay, so this is what we mean by sequestration. And that process of uptake is highest or fastest in younger or middle-aged forests that are growing rapidly, that have vigorous trees that are growing rapidly. But that's uptake. That's quite different from storage, which is the other key aspect of the carbon cycle for us to understand, which can be thought of as basically the product of sequestration, sequestration past. It's the outcome of all the sequestration work that forests have been doing for us over preceding decades. So carbon has been sequestered and now it's stored in biomass above and below ground. And this particular function tends to reach its highest, highest level in more mature and older forests, at least in temperate systems that have a higher degree of structural complexity. Now these are important if we're understanding the role of forests in fighting climate change, because of course what we're trying to do is take carbon out of the atmosphere and then keep it down here in the terrestrial biosphere so some, for some period of time so that it's not up in the atmosphere as a greenhouse gas. And that's why storage is really the currency of carbon markets, for example. This is what offsets reward because we wanna to try to sequester the carbon but then store it in biomass and keep it there for, for the long term or in wood products, but that gets a little more complicated and we'll talk more about that later. Okay, so sequestration versus storage. We'll come back to those in a minute. Okay, so in carbon forestry, the carbon forestry realm, and particularly in international carbon markets, we have basically three general options. There is the avoided deforestation, sometimes also called avoided conversion, um, which might include, but is, is not exclusive to various forms of passive management like conserving high conservation value forests around the world, old growth systems, unique habitats, rare natural communities, wilderness areas, some areas that are used for non-timber forest resources, indigenous uses. It might also include smaller inclusions or uh, lightly managed areas within working forests. Okay, so that's the first general category. And of course, this approach tends to favor that storage function, 
So it's that particular part of the carbon cycle and that particular carbon or climate benefit. Now I wanna dive into this for a second because this one continues to be the source of really tremendous debate. And um, it's kind of come back around recently with a paper that came out just a couple of months ago that I wanna talk about. It's one by Gunderson et al over in Denmark. And I'm, I think some of you have seen it. It's been circulating through the Forest Guild and other groups. And so I, I wanna talk about this a little bit. Okay, so some of you might know that over the last 10 or 20 years, there's been a lot of discussion around the, the potential benefit of older forests as carbon sinks. Now, I wanna be really clear here that this debate is not really about storage. So the idea that old forests have a high degree of biomass and are storing a lot of carbon already is not really in contention. That, that has been shown fairly definitively in systems around the world. Rather, the debate is around that sequestration part and whether old forests continue to take up carbon, sequester it from the, from the atmosphere for longer periods of time than we might initially have thought. Some of you might be familiar with the old Bormans and, Borman and Likens model from the Hubbard Brook Experimental Forest going way back to the 1970s that proposed that carbon uptake should decline to basically zero around the age of 180 to 200 years in northern hardwood forests. So basically, older forests would be carbon neutral in terms of their uptake function. So this paper that I'm showing you right here by Louise Yard et al, these are a led by a, a group in France, it, it received a lot of attention because it, it, it claimed or proposed um, using these figures right here that net ecosystem productivity, that's basically the, 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 the net carbon uptake after you've accounted for respiration by both plants and heterotrophs or animals that net ecosystem productivity in the top panel here remains in positive territory way out into much older forest ages than we might previously have thought. That's the, the X axis here on the bottom. So if, if net ecosystem productivity remains above zero, that means that these old forests are continuing to take up carbon and so therefore their carbon sinks. The problem with this, with this figure and with this paper, and by the way, this has been challenged by a lot of people, there was a lot of criticism of this, of this study, is that they used data sets from all over the world. They took data points, you're seeing 500 different data points in those colors up there in these, in these panels. They come from all over the world, both boreal forests and temperate. And this is everything from coastal redwoods out in California to northern hardwood forests to European beach, like you name it, it's on here. And everybody in this call probably knows that those forest systems are really different. I mean, just the lifespans of those, of those tree species are fundamentally different. So you can't really plot these on the same axis and then make generalizations like this with no kind of corrections or, or normalizations or anything like that. So this paper has legitimately received a lot of criticism. And then again, just recently, I guess in March, um, this hot button paper came out again in uh, as a commentary in Nature, uh, claiming old growth forest carbon sinks overestimated, criticizing this paper, and and now sort of again we're having this debate about older forests: are they carbon sinks? Are they carbon sources? Are they neutral? So I don't know. The, the science will continue to debate this question. This is a good point, by the way, to just acknowledge that this kind of debate is, is part and parcel of science. This is how the science advances. This is exactly what we need. And it's important to understand that the pendulum on these ideas swings back and forth over the course of history until we arrive at a consensus on, on questions like this. I mean, think about the great debates in, in, in science, right? Like Darwin's theory of natural selection introduced in the 1850s. It took decades for, for, uh, for scientists to agree that there was support for that theory. Think of the theory of plate tectonics in the early 20th century, again, met with resounding criticism from geologists, you know, who couldn't imagine that the Earth's crust could be broken into plates that moved around. 
Think about Einstein's theory of, of uh, general relativity and, and special relativity. I mean, it wasn't even until recent times that we had empirical evidence supporting Einstein's theoretical calculations. So yeah, you know, I'm making some, some big claims here in terms of the significance of this scientific debate, but my point is don't jump to conclusions based on a single paper or a single commentary or criticism. Give this time to play out and look at that total arc of history in terms of the literature and how this swings back and forth over time. I do wanna just say though that I tend to come down on the side of there being support, not necessarily for the, the, the sink idea or the long-term sequestration function, but rather the storage value of old forests. And these are my own data actually collected by other people, but then put together in this study, this global analysis of, of old growth forests. We use data sets from temperate forests all over the world, even East Asia. And so rather than plotting all these forest types on a single axis, we have them broken out. And, and what you see is that, yeah, biomass and carbon storage continues to accumulate very late into succession over the long term in temperate systems all over the world, um, perhaps longer than we might previously have, have thought. Now, there are problems with data like this. The scientists on the call are, could quibble with this. They could say, these are chrono sequences. How can you really infer these long-term trends from these, these uh, sequences over time like this? And, and you can't really, but all you can say is that, yeah, these older forests by and large tend to have very high levels of storage compared to younger forests. So think of that as carbon in the bank. These older forests are providing this reservoir of carbon storage that if cut or felled or mismanaged would flux to the atmosphere as a greenhouse gas. So bottom line, there is value in older forests. However, we also know that especially in a place like New England, that carbon value of storage in old forests is going to vary tremendously. Now I'm having trouble seeing this one on my screen. I don't know if you folks can see it, but um, this is from a recent synthesis I did, this chapter called uh, uh, Old Growth Forests, Carbon Sinks or Sources. You know, I, I tried to lay out the different pathways that have been described through empirical research in New England on carbon accumulation in, in northern hardwood forests. And what you're seeing here is that carbon accumulation can play out a whole variety of different ways. Uh, again, I can't really see it right now on my computer, but this top line, I think it's B, shows this pathway of kind of long-term car carbon accumulation that, that seems to happen in some cases. But there's also support for this equilibrium dynamic that Borman and Likens described long ago at Hubbard Brook. For example, um, uh, Craig Lorimer and others have shown this to maybe be uh, more, more the case in, in, in um, the, the Midwest, the upper Midwest in Northern Wisconsin and Northern Minnesota, that after a couple centuries, carbon uptake declines to zero and you, and you achieve this kind of equilibrium dynamic. That's pathway A. But there are also other strange pathways that can happen. So C down here, these early declines in carbon accumulation are something shown recently by Tim Fahey and John Battles and others at Hubbard Brook, partially related to acid deposition. So early declines in forest productivity related to acid rain. D is a reversal of those declines or an arrest of that declining productivity through calcium additions, which has been tried experimentally at Hubbard Brook. So again, there are all kinds of different ways in which carbon accumulation can play out. Down here at the bottom, this pathway E is what I've shown to be the case in, in some of these primary forests, never cleared, never logged, never harvested, old growth forests in the Adirondacks and elsewhere that seem to be in these non-equilibrium dynamic states in which more or less periodic intermediate intensity disturbances like wind throw events and insect outbreaks and ice storms periodically disrupt carbon accumulation 
and biomass bounces up and down over time. But the point is that in all of these pathways, more or less, these, the, the uptake function might vary tremendously, just as that Gunderson et al. paper you know, has recently argued. But in all of these carbon storage, high levels of biomass more or less remains the case over the long term. So these older forests, even when they're highly dynamic, are providing high net levels of carbon storage on the landscape, probably higher compared to the net carbon stocking that more intensively managed forests, uh, such as uh, forests managed under shorter rotations would provide. Okay, so again, the importance of understanding storage versus sequestration, but just understanding that the science has shown that these functions can play out lots of different ways, depending on disturbance dynamics and um, uh, human influences like acid deposition and, and uh, all sorts of other things. Okay, we could go on and on with that. Okay, so that was a deep dive into this current debate around the carbon value of old forests. And I hope you got the point that the science is complicated and there are lots of different ways that they, that can play out. So let's not jump to conclusions about there being one single answer to the, the question of you know, what is the carbon value of old forests. Okay, so we have two more basic approaches to carbon forestry. Reforestation, afforestation, easiest to understand. Plant new trees, they grow rapidly, they take up carbon and sequester it. Um, and there are lots of opportunities for this, particularly through riparian restoration, but also urban tree planting is, is a big category now um, in the carbon market world. All right, let's move on. Okay, yeah, and so then the final category of carbon forestry and the one that we need to spend uh, some more time on and um, the, the area that I think John is gonna speak about as well. So the carbon world calls improved forest management. Now this is the one that offers the greatest potential for working forests clearly because it includes a huge variety of different silvicultural approaches and things that we might do out there on the landscape to, to ratchet up incrementally the net amount of carbon stocking that we're providing in working forests. And this provides tremendous potential because there's huge flexibility silviculturally in, in things that landowners and foresters might try. Um, so everything from irregular shelterwood systems or a multi-aged or multi-cohort systems that many of you might be familiar with, such as this picture here showing uh, irregular shelterwood in Minnesota, um, and we can just click through these maybe a little bit um, to uh, the, the Femmelschlag or expanding gap uh, group irregular shelter wood with legacy tree retention that Bob Seymour and others have experimented with up in Maine to an approach I've tried in Vermont called structural complexity enhancement. All of these things add carbon storage, let's pause here for, for a minute, to the landscape over the course of multiple rotations or, or entries. Okay, so um, let's take a close look at um, the carbon benefits as we think about both varying levels of retention. So retaining trees over the long term, but also what we might call extended rotations or extended entry cycles, basically harvesting forests a little bit less frequently. Now, I'm gonna take a, a deep dive into another paper here because this is one that it has, has frequently been cited in carbon talks recently around our region. And I'm going to say that this paper has not always been accurately represented. So I would like to kind of set the record straight a little bit. So um, this is a paper that uh, Jared Nunnery and, and I did together way back in the late um, 20, 20 knots. I think the research was done in, in 2008, published in 2010. And, and we modeled nine different forest management scenarios, a no management or passive scenario, and then eight active management scenarios, trading off varying levels of retention and short versus longer uh, harvesting frequencies. We can go to the next slide. And in this study, 
that was was fairly basic at the time. And I want to just yeah point out a couple of shortcomings of the paper. We, we began with this no management baseline, which you're seeing here. So this was a fairly simple projection of forest growth using the forest vegetation simulator. Thank you, Xander, for, for sharing the citation. Um, Projecting forest growth over time. Now, remember, the, the, this research was in 2008. And so, again, this idea that the science evolves, there's debate, there's pushback, there's argumentation, and that's critical to advancing the science. That's exactly what happened here in this case. At that time, in the early 2000s, we as scientists were just beginning to explore carbon forestry a little bit. And our tools that were available at that time were somewhat limited. Our computer models, well, we had some, but, but they, were, they were still somewhat limited in their ability to model things like natural disturbances or to incorporate climate change. They were certainly not well um, equipped to handle or to model the effect of invasive species. Of course, we've also learned a lot more about loss of foundational species like hemlock and large beech and, and um, you know, potential other, potentially other things. So this line right here, you know, was, was a point of reference, which was important for this study, but as acknowledged in the paper, had a lot of limitations. So my advice to, to, to folks watching today would, if, if, you, if you're interested in this idea of passive management or the, the first option that we talked about, wilderness, passively managed forests, that's great. There might be a lot, there, there are a lot of carbon and climate values associated with that. But take a look at the more recent literature that has modeled that type of approach more rigorously than we were able to do back in 2008 when we were not able to model things like natural disturbances and climate change and all of these other things listed here. Okay, uh, we can keep going, Logan, next slide. Okay, so now let's talk about the silviculture and you can just click through these like boom, 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 boom. So what we're showing here is just starting with the most intensive management scenario at the bottom where forests are being cut at high intensity with, with no or minimal tree retention on short rotations. And then as we move up through these sequences, uh, these timelines that you're seeing here projected out over 160 years, we are adding retention and we are decreasing harvesting frequency. Or another way of saying that is that we're increasing rotation period or entry cycle. And as you can see, the net amount of carbon stored over the long term, even accounting for multiple harvests, as well as carbon that is harvested and then transferred into wood products. And by the way, that's captured right there on the Y axis. So carbon that's transferred into wood products where it then has a residency period or a lifespan as it moves through the wood product stream and various different types of wood products, even accounting for all of those carbon fluxes the less intensive management scenarios, where we go a little bit lighter on the land, where we practice retention forestry, or maybe shift to multi-age systems or retention-based systems, and maybe lengthen uh, the, the period between harvests, those tend to increase the net carbon storage on the landscape. We can go to the next slide, please. Okay, so that's shown here. And then if you just click a couple of times. So here we have all of those scenarios that we modeled over 160 years arrayed on this continuum of most intensive on the left, left to least intensive on the right. Now, the point of, no, so the answer to your question, uh, Richard, is that this does not include substitution effects, which by the way, was another critical you know, a uh, source of uncertainty at that time, back in 2008, when the very first papers on substitution effects had just come in and, and or just been published. And we acknowledge that in the paper, and, and I'm gonna talk about substitution effects in just a minute, um, because those are critically important. Okay, so, but what this paper did show and what we were arguing at that time is that, 
we can add carbon to the landscape through slight adjustments in our silviculture, through slight tweaks by, by uh, moving from more intensive scenarios to slightly or moderately less intensive scenarios through um, systems like irregular shelter wood and, and group selection with retention and, and all of these approaches that people are trying. Structural complexity enhancement, uh, that's the thing I've tested. And all of, these, all of these approaches add this margin of carbon storage to the landscape. Okay, so that was the conclusion of this paper. That was the key message, that we have options out there for foresters. There are a variety of tools in the tool bag that we can think about using in different places, depending on landowner objectives and depending on um, site quality and, and, and developmental stage and, and all sorts of other things. Okay, we can keep moving along. Rich Carbonetti asked about substitution effects. Okay, so another great example of how the science advances and how you know, our understanding expands over time. So in the last decade, there's been tremendous interest in this idea of using durable wood products as a long-term carbon sink. So this might include things like mass timber, you know, cross laminated, um, you know, uh, large dimension um, framing materials, basically using wood in place of concrete, steel, plastics, composites, other things that have a much higher carbon footprint associated with their production. Uh, go to the next slide, please. And so this is something that we now know has real carbon benefits. So these are actually some, some somewhat early uh, data from long ago, but basically just showing that concrete steel, these other construction materials have, have much higher carbon emissions associated with their manufacturing than does timber. You can go to the next panel clicking ahead. And this is important because if we think about using wood, durable wood products, in place of other things that have a, a, a large emissions associated with their production, we can basically avoid those emissions that would have accrued. And those add up over time. Those are what we call substitution effects. Uh, if we could click one more time, that's shown here in this panel. It's the top blob in this, this figure, the substitution effects, basically the avoided emissions every time we use wood in place of something else. And these add up over time. And at, at some point, they can actually exceed the carbon storage value of the unmanaged forest. Okay, we can keep going in the interest of time. And then just click through these next bullets if you could. I, the, the point here with this panel, we have two completely different figures or, or panels here, the top and the bottom, both showing substitution effects. The point being that substitution effects also actually are very tricky, that they vary tremendously based on the forest type, the management regime, the particular types of products that are generated, how markets respond in terms of reducing or increasing harvest rates. There are all kinds of feedbacks in the marketplace, in a global market such as timber that, that can happen and that can affect the extent to which we might be able to achieve these substitution effects. So again, the science is complicated and, and um, qualify, caveat, caveat your, your statements around this. Okay, but substitution effects are important. Okay, so um, let's just fly through these. Um, we can click through these. I'm, I'll, I'll end here with co-benefits. So um, yeah, well, actually, if you can go back just one, um, Logan. Yeah, there we go. So th the other advantage of thinking about um, carbon uh, benefits in working for us, so ways in which we might incrementally ratchet up carbon stocking or carbon storage in, wor in working for us through this, this range of carbon silviculture that I've talked about. The, the other benefit is that carbon tends to be an effective umbrella for a lot of other functions that we care about out on the landscape, like diversity of, of habitats for biodiversity, like structurally complex forests that do an exceptional job at regulating hydrology and providing flood resilience. 
um, like a whole variety of things. And, and uh, Dominic Tom, Tom, who's on this call, and I uh, showed this recently in this paper in which um, we looked at the silvicultural approaches that have been proposed by the National Audubon Society as part of their silviculture with birds in mind or forestry for the birds. And we looked at those approaches and we showed that each of those have different carbon functions, different carbon values, and tend to provide different kinds of structures out there on the landscape that provide, again, a range of co-benefits. But as, you show, as you're seeing here on the panel to the right, if you look at carbon storage, that's the y-axis, in comparison to something called the H-index, that's an aggregate measure of structural complexity. Think of it as the, the architectural complexity of a forest. There's a pretty solid relationship between carbon storage and structural complexity across the range of these silvicultural approaches that, that, um, that Audubon is advocating. And that's encouraging. It shows that we can try a variety of things out there on the landscape, and they're going to have these co-benefits in terms of structural complexity. Okay, we can keep going. I'll just finish up here in one or two minutes. Uh, of course, all of this is really important in the context of, of working for us in New England, especially. Click just one here, because arguably the most important thing that we can do on the New England landscape for the climate is to simply keep forests as forests, to keep them in forest cover, to provide incentives that help working forests to remain economically viable. And this is really important in the context of declining forest cover, which of course we're now seeing in all six New England states um, do not to agriculture or to forest management, but do entirely to suburban and exurban sprawl. Um, the, the perforation of the landscape through housing development that is causing this decline in forest cover. So incentives that we can add through carbon forestry and carbon offsets that help working forests to remain in business will help, will help um, to conserve that forest uh, cover that we need out there on the land landscape to sequester and store carbon. Okay, so that's really important co-benefits. That's kind of the bottom line for carbon forestry. Next slide, please. We can end right here. Yeah, so um, that's great. I'm sorry to have, have gone over. There's obviously so much that we can talk about, but um, this is actually a great picture to stop on right here. So I'll end right there and take questions later, but turn it over to John for now. Thank you so much, Bill. Um, all right, so John's going to get ready to share his screen. Thank you so much for taking the time to prepare that. Hey, hello, everyone. So thanks for, for joining us today. And thanks, uh, Amanda and the Forest Tours Guild for, for hosting this. Uh, I'm amazed that there's still this kind of appetite to, uh, to talk about carbon inside on a screen when the Phoebes have started singing, at least in my backyard here. So. Um, Anyway, I, uh, so I'm going to jump right in, and uh, and and so I think you know Bill Bill covered a lot of ground here, and, and I think really what what I'm going to focus on are are three topics that I think I can I can put under the under the portfolio um, considerations that 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 Bill mentioned here. Um, sorry, I'm seeing the chat box. And I know. Okay. Um, and so these are these are some things that that I've been thinking a lot about lately, and and um, kind of builds off some recent research that I'm that I'm doing, um, and and I think help uh, maybe put put carbon forestry in in context of of maybe the typical kinds of decisions that that foresters have already been been making, and and just trying to make the link to to some of these these practices and and to think about the the carbon aspects of them. So the first piece here really, really relates to this idea of, of stabilizing carbon stocks. And I think if you look, if you look to the Western US and, and there may be a, an extreme example here, but, but thinking about, about forests that might be high carbon stocks today, but are, are generally at risk of, of losing those, those carbon stocks because of of you know past management and and current droughts and all these other dynamics that that this this really provides some context to start thinking about what is you know 
what's important about uh, about about carbon and, and maintaining carbon in forests and and so we can we can think about that stability in the context of of risk from from disturbances and that's you know obviously something that 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 foresters are are already already doing day to day and so i want to put that kind of that risk management in in the context of carbon and in our backyard here in in new england with uh, with new hampshire as an example um, so i did some work just trying to think about how to how to identify where we need to be thinking about some of these disturbance risks and so i mapped um, areas of, of forest that that have uh, have a significant component of, of hemlock in, in the in the in these towns, um, and then layered that with with where we know hemlock woolly adelgid already exists, um, and to start thinking about you know kind of highlighting um, this 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 threat to to forest. And now when we we think about woolly adelgid and layer this on top uh, with with another another risk here in terms of of the emerald ash borer. Um, we, you know, we start to build this 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 picture that um, that there, there's a lot going on in the landscape here that we need to worry about, and we can add a whole bunch of other risks to this to this map as well. We can think about invasive uh, other invasive plant species and how that how that relates to to things like uh, road and trail networks. We can look at development development pressure and and the the sort of the risk of 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 uh, disturbance in terms of the fragmentation that happens. Um, and then layer on top of that, thinking about these these carbon stocks that are that are potentially at, at risk out there. And when we when we put them all together, there's there's a you know area of of, of New Hampshire that that really rises to the surface here that that have high carbon stocks, but are also at high risk of of disturbance. Now to look at this in, in a slightly slightly different way, um, the, basically those those towns are mostly in this blue region here. So in this in this sort of simple simple matrix, kind of looking at, at the, the cluster of of towns that have relatively high carbon stocks and also relatively high risk according to all these factors. And the one common aspect about about this land here is that you know it's it, part of it is is in this region of of rapidly increasing population as as you know as bill bill mentioned some of those those pressures in terms of forest loss and the tendency at least you know in the where where i live in in suburban maine is is for the the local land trust to uh, to to see that that development pressure happening um and and want to protect those lands and and often are faced with a decision do we do we protect these lands and and um, you know, set them as, as, as off limits for any harvesting going forward and, you know, and, and think about this sort of this long term trajectory that, that, that Bill described in terms of, of moving and developing more complex uh, age structures, um, or do we manage in these in these stands and so um, so part of what we need to consider then is, is thinking about the, the, the risk or the, the stability of those carbon stocks in those forests and and if you're in one of these areas here where uh, you've got a high uh, a high proportion of your of your of your forest is is in one of these species uh, or a species mix that that is at, at high risk to to some of these looming threats um, then then we're faced with this this potential of, of having really unstable carbon stocks and having having the, lost the ability to uh, to to mitigate that um, that carbon loss, that immediate carbon loss, and, and thinking about the, the future and the and the species composition in the future, and I'll I'll come back to that. But this just as a just as kind of another extreme example here uh, from the Hemlock Ravine at the at the Fox Forest in in Hillsborough, New Hampshire, which is right in one of those those kind of high carbon, high risk areas. Um, the hemlock hemlock represent almost seventy percent of the of the total basal area in that stand, and and your eyes are not deceiving you. This is this is square meters per hectare in terms of basal area um, and carbon stocks. I um, had a student measuring <laughs> measuring trees out there, and I I had to go back out there to confirm because I was shocked at how much. Um, how much volume is is out in that ravine? But I, I show this to really just sort of highlight this this idea that if 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 the desire is to is to put forest forests on a on a trajectory with developing this this kind of greater uh, 
complexity, older age classes, larger diameter trees, that the, the species composition is going to matter. And as, as Bill's model of, of no management, you know, did not incorporate any of those, those kinds of disturbances, this highlights the, the you know, those, the kind of risk that, that, that comes into play as these forests develop. Um, and again, coming back to old forests again, but, but really just as a matter of context that, that you know, these, these old stands, and they, these, are, these are from throughout, uh, throughout the Northeast, New England and New York, um, just plotting the, the, the volume of, of carbon out there. In many cases here, you know, three to five times the, the FIA um, mean in terms of, of stocking. And so to move forests along in that trajectory um, requires a lot of things that, to happen. A lot of these assumptions need to, need to play out. Um, and again, to kind of highlight the the, the risk of, of of these stocks and the and the, I guess what's what's counting against us in terms of, of being able to to continue to to develop these 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 older older forest age classes. Um, we went back to uh, Big Reed Forest Preserve, Nature Conservancy land up in northern Maine, and and uh, Plum Creek now Warehouser lands. Um, that where Manomet uh, did some work in, in around 1995, um, and we went back in 2011 and remeasured remeasured these plots to get an understanding of how things might have changed out there. And and just quickly, you can see in the in kind of the, the late successional stands, um, the the overall the above ground uh, above ground live and dead standing stocks increased um, generally in in those in those stands, but. On the other hand, the, the old old growth forest up in, in Big Reed actually declined, and so um, so getting and losing some of that that carbon stock that's out there. But note that even at the at the diminished state in, in 2011, it's still greater than than the uh, than the late successional stands. But we know why this happened, and again, it comes down to the species mix and and some dynamics that. Um, that I know many of you know <laughs> know very well that um, in, a, in a place like Big Reed, um, a large proportion of the volume out there is was in was in American Beach um, that that has been hit by the the, the beach bark disease. And so, in uh, in from about 2003 to 2006, there was these these trees these large diameter trees were already stressed out, um, and we had a had a drought over that period of time. And so. We saw a big, big pulse of mortality in those in those large trees, and you see the how the diameter distribution shifted um, from from ninety five to two thousand eleven in those stands, and now we've got lots of lots of little beach coming in there, um, and so that has implications in terms of 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 the the stability of those carbon stocks and the ability for that for the I guess the, the resilience of those of those stands at, at Big Reed to ever ever achieve the, the volumes that they once had if you've got if you've now got got beach that's that's taken over the understory. So I'm going to shift now into into a, a quick discussion on on this decision decisions that we make once a disturbance has happened and so um, the spruce budworm uh, provides an opportunity to, to think about that. Um, and I arrived in Orono just at the at the tail end of the last outbreak, and now we're 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 seeing the, the start of the next one. So um, I guess I'm showing the uh, my age class distribution here. Um, but this uh, I think provides an interesting opportunity that there you know probably going to be some real decisions that uh, that landowners and foresters are, are going to need to make in terms of of, of salvaging. Dead trees, and so we looked. We looked at at the implications of of using FIA data and and the same FES models that um, that, that Bill used. So we looked at at the life cycle carbon implications. So you know, including what happens to to uh, the harvested products, whether it's stored in lumber and paper or used for energy. We looked at the at the substitution benefits, um, and so we modeled in in FIA data. A decision to salvage or not salvage, and to look at how how the forest responds um, in the in the context of carbon. And so, so this graph here shows shows basically over time the difference between the, the salvage and no salvage scenarios. And and we've got this this dynamic where where a period of time that there's there's a net emission to the atmosphere generally over the over the next ten to twenty years that from when you decide to salvage, there's actually more carbon in the atmosphere than than if you did not salvage. But that begins to flip as you get further out in time, as the as the forest response responds, and there's kind of the persistent benefit of the, of the harvested wood products. 
And so, so there's this, this temporal aspect of this decision that, you know, on one, on one hand, there's, there's this, this urgency about, um, about addressing climate issues in the near term and that any, any extra ton of, of CO2 that's sent to the atmosphere today has, has a long-term impact. And so we want to look at that a little bit and, and understand um, using discount rates as, as a way to, to, to sort of put, put more, more or less value on carbon emitted today versus in, in, the, in the future. And so you see what happens here. The red line is, is at a 0%, you know, basically no discount rate on up to 5%. And so as you, as you get into th the three, three to 5% range, um, your decision start, maybe starts to change a little bit in terms of how you think about, um, think about carbon and, and a decision to salvage. So the upshot from this work is that, that generally when, when the, the, the basal area of, of host species, in this case, uh, fir and spruce is high, and there's also an average, a high uh, a mean diameter, the, from a carbon perspective, the, 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 the decision might, might be to, to not salvage or at least salvage less. Um, and particularly when you when you consider high discount rates, so valid, valuing that near term near term storage more than the, than that future storage, um, it drives that that conclusion to 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 not salvage. Um, and I know I'm I'm running out of time here, but I want to just then kind of move into another this other kind of piece of the portfolio in terms of of thinking about how we how we rehabilitate stands that um, that maybe have have experienced some of these disturbances. May have been the the the, the victim of, of of bad management choices in the past, um, and and just talk about that as an opportunity here, where where really the, the main the main opportunity we have is to start thinking about shifting species composition with within these stands and and moving them to uh, to maybe longer lived species or or a mix of species that that are at at lower risk in terms of of, of some of these disturbances that we're aware of today. Um, and so, you know, and as, as we know, I mean, the, the, the work that, um, that I've, I've, I've talked about elsewhere and, and was in that, in that paper there, but, you know, we've, we've identified that, you know, maybe 30 to 40% of, of the landscape is, is understocked from a, from a kind of a commercially desirable standpoint. So there's, there's this shift in, in, in species to less, less desirable species um, and also in poor quality. And so, Sort of focusing on those those stands that that um, that need some early inter intervention here to start shifting them in a in a direction that that's going to have benefits in terms of of improving kind of the saw log to, to low grade ratio and trying to increase the the value um, the value in these stands that that the opportunities are can be somewhat limited and depending on what you have to start with and maybe that's that's no surprise to anybody, but the, in this case, the, the, these category one stands are the kind of highest quality and the category five are the lowest quality. And so looking at, at this, uh, this timber stand improvement practice, which is really a, a really aggressive um, thinning from below to, to shift species to, to more desirable species um, and a crop tree release that was a, a thinning from above with, with kind of the same, same objective. That there's really not much, not much you you, you can do here in terms of, of thinking about um, about in these these really poor quality stands because there's not much there. Um, but we we start to see some movement in these um, in in the stands where there's actually a little bit more to work with here that that you can you can start to nudge that that ratio um, up and it's not granted it's you know it's not a huge amount but this is northern hardwood in in New England. Um, so, but there's, you know, so trying to demonstrate that, that it, it seems like there's some opportunities here to, to think about, about these, these kind of intentional treatments that are shifting species composition. And the added benefit is that it actually, there's, there's, a, there's a carbon upside to this. And, and partly is because a lot of the, the desired commercial species are also, um, you know, longer, longer lived, higher carbon dense species. And so um, on, What's unusual for a lot of this modeling that you know that that Bill and I do is that you you almost never see the managed the managed scenario um, exceed the exceed the unmanaged scenario. And here, um, after after bit, about twenty five years, we start to start to see that happening. Um, it's it's minimal at this point, but it, it, at the very least, it it shows that there's there's minimal impact on carbon stocks, and that. That over time, as and this is what we're we're kind of trying to look at in in more depth right now, is trying to understand how these 
these longer term dynamics might play out. And, and this is, I think, consistent with some of the work at the Penobscot Experimental Forest that, you know, that there's not seeing huge kind of huge economic benefits to rehabilitating some of these, these high graded stands, you know, in the, in this sort of interim, you know, 30 to 40 year period, but um, there are more options that are, that are created for, um, for future management decisions. And, and at least based on this work, it doesn't seem like there's a, there's a huge carbon cost to doing that. So quick, quick summary from a, you know, from a forestry pr perspective, I see these addressing these forest health risks as really addressing carbon risks as well. And so that's, I, th I think the good news in terms of, of, of forestry is that, that we've already got tools and, and a mindset for thinking about these things. And I think um, being able to, to communicate about those, those values and how, um, how those activities can, can buffer or mitigate that and, and stabilize those carbon stocks and, and show that that, um, you know, that that is a value and that, that gets us to that goal of you know, addressing, addressing that risk and driving that increase of, of forest carbon stocks um, over time. And, and, and oh, by the way, when, when we do that, we've got, we, get, we get larger diameter trees that go into longer lived products. Um, but thinking also now about, about kind of salvage as a disturbance response, I, th I think we, you know, we really need to sort of think through some of these short and long-term implications. I know I was guilty in one of my first jobs in, in forestry right after the 98 ice storm. Um, I think we were way too aggressive in, in pursuing the, the, the damaged, um, damaged trees in these stands and I think set back quality and, and um, and, and some of these dynamics in these stands for, for a long time. And I think, so, so thinking about that salvage as a, as a decision that has long-term implication in terms of carbon, but also in the, in the future quality of these stands. Um, and then just also just highlighting our, our, our tools in terms of this rehabilitation silviculture and, and thinking about how we, how we shift species composition over time in, in ways that, um, that, are, that are adaptive and, and, and think about, um, try to anticipate risk as, as best as we can. So thank you very much. All right, John and Bill, thank you so much for, for your presentations. I recognize we are just after the top of the hour and people are gonna need to jump off. So a virtual round of applause for our presenters. Thank you so much, Bill and John. Um, this is great. Um, we did get a few questions in the chat window, so and we are recording this. So if um, John, if you're able to stick around for a few minutes and take some questions, that would be wonderful. I believe that uh, Bill needed to jump off and uh, take care of another appointment. Um, but uh, for about ten minutes. Oh, okay, great. All right, let me uh, switch tracks a little bit then. Um, uh, Stephen Wood asks, Bill, I'm wondering how competition, slowing of growth, is figured into these models of complex stands and how much difference there is in high value, typically longer term storage product. Um, yeah, so competition is certainly a key element of the models that are used to project forest growth and yield. Um, and these, you know, these estimates of long-term carbon storage. So competition is intrinsic to that. Um, I think that one of the interesting Things that we've seen, though, in, in the older forests is that, you know, as gap dynamics happen and you see, you know, older trees maybe dying and dropping out of the, the canopy because of disturbance or, or senescence, you have other trees that are co-dominant or maybe sort of in an intermediate position in the canopy taking their place. And so the, the loss of the old trees is often compensated by growth and release, uh, basically reduce competition in, in smaller diameter trees. And so th that kind of dynamic is actually really important for understanding these long-term carbon consequences of, um, of both extended rotations as well as, as management for older and structurally complex forests. So I'm not sure if that answered your question. Of course, competition is is, is uh, a key element in the production of, of you know, tight grained wood, which has you know, higher density and, and carbon value and, and utility for uh, other you know, wood products as a, as a consequence of that. So I'm not sure if I'm getting at your question, but um, you know, certainly it's a key, a key factor from a, from a lot of perspectives. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think I wanna pitch the next question to John. Um, there's, more, there's more questions coming up in the chat window. Um, John, uh, 
someone asked if you could kind of clarify the use of discounting um, from your presentation. So similar to, to yeah, discounting, you know, financial discounting. So we looked at the um, the net, uh, the periodic uh, net difference in in carbon sequestration under those under those two scenarios. So um, so basically, a kind of a, a net present value of of carbon at, at each at each time step. Great, thank you. Um, I'm actually going to jump to a question from Tom Worthley. Um, he's asking about the implications of not salvaging for leakage or substitution of demand utilization, especially when salvage and rehab activities can be combined. Um, John, if you want to start. Well, I think so, right. So that means some of the decision to salvage, I guess there's, you know, if, if that uh, event is is happening and, and essentially could flood you know flood a market I guess that's the, the question right what's what's driving the, the the marketplace is it the supply of, of suddenly of all this uh, of all this dead wood and um, so I, I think th those are those are parts of that that consideration what you know what it, if the, if the salvage event happens, what you know, what's 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 driving the the, the production of, of wood and the consumption globally? I mean, obviously, we know global timber consumption is 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 on a on a pretty steep in, increase here over time. So, I think those those leakage questions are are certainly are are complicated and important to, to think about. But um, but I think that salvage in a big in a big disturbance. Uh, Event probably adds a whole other level of complexity there in terms of which, what's driving what's driving the harvesting, the market or the salvage it, it, itself. Yeah, Bill, did you want to jump in on this one? Well, I'll just add that you know we've done some research recently on intermediate intensity wind throw, basically things like microbursts and tornadoes and ice storms, and you know we've shown that those disturbed forests still have tremendously high carbon storage and, and residual biomass. They also have um, a lot of surviving trees and they have release of, of mid canopy and, and understory trees. And so there's a lot of carbon value in either not salvaging or lightly salvaging in that those moderately disturbed stands uh, will continue to store a, a lot of carbon. So uh, yeah, from a carbon forestry standpoint, salvage is you know, might not be the best way to go. And to throw another confusing question in here, someone asks, um, how would you think differently about risk to existing carbon stocks versus risk to future sequestration potential? Well, I think I mean yeah, Bill. I mean I mean Bill showed. I mean the, the two go hand in hand, right? It's it, you. Um, that the the diagram that 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 Bill showed, like that you, you you can't have the, the the bucket can't be full unless it's unless it's being filled, and so you need to sort of think about think about the, the those two dynamics as they go together. And part of what I guess part of what I what I was trying to to describe is is thinking about buffering that those wild those wild fluxes that um, you know that's what we're seeing in the Western U.S. right now. Um, in terms of suddenly that big that big pulse of of carbon uh, to the atmosphere, um, and that's what's important in the near term, but also the long term stability of of the you know the, the stocks is something to consider, and that's where thinking about about you know management decisions that um, that that you know it nudge nudge species composition in a way you know through through encouraging regeneration of of more desired species, and um, I think trying to to buffer. Them that you know those kind of those big pulses of, of loss that can happen. Good with that, Bill. <laughs> yep, that's fine. We can move on. Okay, um, I'm going to give you kind of a final question because I recognize we are a little bit over time. Um, mm -hmm. So, for foresters who work with woodland owners, what would you share as a take-home message about managing old forests with carbon in mind? Well. I, I will, I'll, I'll try, uh, I'll make an attempt at answering this. And, and this might relate to a question I'm seeing in the chat box right now about proforestation. So, you know, as I began my, my talk, I am of the opinion, and, and I believe that this is well supported by the science, that we need to spread the risk 
that this is not a one size fits all approach and that we need a whole variety of different carbon forestry options in our, in our portfolio, in our tool bag. And proforestation, the idea of, of deliberately allowing forests to, to grow into an older structurally complex condition could certainly be an element of this overall holistic strategy. But I'm also of the opinion that these other approaches, these carbon silviculture approaches must be and, and, and should be the lion's share of what we do on the landscape for a whole variety of reasons. We can look at the, the need to adapt to climate change. We can look at the effect of just, I mean, just look at beach bark disease alone and how the, the phenomena of beach sprouting has really fundamentally altered the dynamics of our forests. And, and, and we cannot count on forests developing into the future the same way they did in the past. We can look at loss of foundational species and, and invasive species on the horizon like EAB and hemlock woolly delgid and Asian longhorn beetle and all these reasons why uh, active silvicultural management for carbon and for a whole variety of other functions is going to have to be a, a, you know, a critical component of, of what we do on the landscape. And so far I've only talked about the ecology. You know, it, it's sort of like not to mention all of the other objectives that landowners have for their lands and all the other values that we derive from actively managed, well-managed, sustainably managed working for us. So, you know, I, the bottom line for me is this carbon for portfolio idea. Um. Yeah, no, and I, I agree. And I think, you know, I mean, part of that portfolio also needs to consider the other all the other ecosystem service benefits that you know that we expect from forests that you know that that, that carbon you know should be I think you know an important part of decision making but but really we're you know we're thinking about balancing these other these other needs whether it's water quality whether it's it's the kind of recreation you know whether whether it's you know it's em employment and economy and those are all those are all valid objectives and I, I think um, thinking of that portfolio approach, not just in terms of carbon outcomes, but but all these other outcomes, and that's uh, that's that's the complexity that that we exist within. And um, you know, I, I think, uh, yeah, I, I mean, there's uh, obviously a role for uh, for more more protected lands. I mean, New England in, in general um, is 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 pretty weak in that regard, at least northern New England. So, um, you know, I, I think I I agree with Bill's Bill's thoughts here. Yeah, the, the degree is, the, the, the question is always finding that right balance, right? Striking the right balance. And that, that's a, such a difficult question and such an important one from a policy standpoint. You know, it's, it's a question that bedevils the forestry sector literally throughout the world. You know, that, that tension between how much should be in reserves, how much should be working forests, how much should be intensively managed industrial forests. And I don't claim to have the answer to that right off the bat. I'm just gonna say that it's a really important policy debate. And I think both John and I are sort of, you know, we, we see the value in, in, in both approaches and having those as part of the mix. Yeah. Awesome, thank you. And Bill, I recognize you need to go um, and we've kept our, our audience over time just a bit. Um, once again, thank you, Bill. Thank you, John, so much for taking the time to share this knowledge. Um, for folks that are out there, we are recording this. We are gonna try to share as many uh, resources and links to papers as we can um, after the webinar concludes. Um, so once again, virtual round of applause. Thank you, uh, Bill and John for your time. Thanks very much. You're welcome, thank you. Take care, everybody. Stay safe.